Right, good morning, colleagues, uh, and welcome to the 22nd meeting in 2016 the Finance and Constitution Committee. I have apologies from Tom Arthur, one of the new members of the committee, who is convening a private bill committee this morning, but I welcome George Adam, who is attending as his substitute. For item one, uh, which is, uh, uh, I want to invite Angela Conces. Welcome, Angela, to the committee. I hope you, you, you enjoy your time on it, uh, to declare any relevant interests you may have. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. I'm very pleased to join the committee. I uh, refer members to my uh, register of interest. Uh, I have no known uh, interests that are relevant to the, the remit uh, of this committee. Um, although in the interest of transparency in terms of our, our later uh, agenda item in terms of the Winchborough uh, development, it's not in my constituency, but it is in the neighbouring uh, West Lothian constituency, so I am um, very much aware of it. Um, also, can I invite George Adam, um, who's substituting for Tom Arthur. Again, welcome to your first appearance as substitute here, Tom. Uh, George, to declare any relevant interests. Thank you, convener. I've just rechecked my published statement, and I have no interests that uh, affect the committee one way or another. OK, there's nothing to do with St Myrna on the agenda of the day. Then. No, I don't think so. Um, I should remind the people at the beginning to also switch off their, their, their mobile phones. I put them in a mode that doesn't interfere. And I thank you for those who have just declared their interests. The next item on the agenda is to decide whether we take item six in private. Are we all agreed? agreed. Members are agreed. The third item on the agenda today is to take evidence on the European Withdrawal Bill from the Cabinet Secretary. This session follows on from the evidence last week with the Secretary of State for Scotland. And I welcome our witnesses to the meeting. And Michael Russell, the Cabinet Secretary for Government Business and Constitutional Relations. Gerald Byrne, who is the team leader for constitutional policy, and Stephen McGregor, the head of the Parliamentary Legislation Unit in the Scottish Government. Uh, but before we move to questions uh, from the committee, I invite the Cabinet Secretary, who wishes to make uh, some short opening remarks, please. Th uh, thank you, convener, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. Um, I think it's worth reminding ourselves at the outset of how central the Sewell Convention is to the position of this Parliament in the constitutional arrangements in the United Kingdom. Essentially, for as long as Westminster claims unlimited parliamentary sovereignty, the existence of this Parliament and the Scottish Government is always contingent at Westminster's will. Westminster can legislate in devolved areas or change the powers of this Parliament or Scottish ministers without us being able to do anything about it legally. Recognising this, the Sewell Convention was established in 1998 as the original Scotland Bill was going through to provide protection for this Parliament from Westminster, undermining our legislation or interfering in our powers. And the Convention has operated since 1999, impeccably observed by both government and, and parliaments, respecting devolved competence and devolved decision-making. As David Mundell said last week, that has included matters in which there has been a good deal of potential controversy, not least the independence referendum, until now. We're all familiar with the events of the Withdrawal Bill. I want to emphasise two points, both of which appear in the Secretary of State's evidence last week. First, in answer to Mr Tompkins, Mr Mundell said that the Sewell Convention had been, in quotes, adhered to. For the avoidance of doubt, the Scottish Government does not believe that is the case. We believe that the Sewell Convention was breached in the passage of the Act. Consent was properly sought. It was denied by this Parliament, but the Bill nevertheless proceeded. Nothing happened between the seeking of consent and its refusal to make th those circumstances, in inverted commas, not normal. By contrast, in Northern Ireland, the UK Government made clear on introduction of Bills that circumstances were not normal, for reasons we understand. The difference is clear. The sole convention is of no value if the UK government can decide at the end of the process that consent is not, after all, required, if it, particularly if it's not forthcoming. That the UK government considered it was a legitimate approach for the Withdrawal Act should concern all of us. Secondly, the Secretary of State said it was very clear back in 1998 when the convention emerged that the Westminster Parliament would always be able to legislate on devolved matters. He said to the Commons in June this year, while the devolution settlements did not predict EU exit, they did explicitly provide that in situations of disagreement, the UK Parliament may be required to legislate without the consent of devolved legislatures. In my view, these statements stand the Sewell Convention on its head. Indeed, the Scotland Act made clear the legal right of Westminster to legislate in devolved areas. It could not do anything else in our system. But the point of the Convention is that the legal right to legislate in devolved areas will not be used except with the consent of this Parliament, most decidedly not in situations of disagreement. So I think there is grave cause for concern about the future of the Sewell Convention under this Government. It appears to think it has adhered to the Convention, 
but only by emptying it of any meaning or value in protecting this Parliament. This is not an absolutist position as the Secretary of State contends. This is simple recognition of the purpose of the Convention and practice over 20 years. There is therefore a problem that needs to be fixed. This has also been identified by the Commons Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee in its report on these matters published in July. The Scottish Government has made various suggestions to address the problem for discussion with the UK Government. These include revisiting the statutory provisions in the Scotland Act, which were extensively considered by past committees under you as convener. I am writing today again to David Liddington to set such discussion in motion, and a copy of that letter will be provided to you. I hope he will respond positively to that request. I also look forward to discussing these matters with parties here in the Parliament, both later today and subsequently. In the meantime, as I said to the committee last week, the Government will work with the UK Government to develop Brexit legislation to ensure that Scottish interests are protected as far as we can. But we cannot in all conscience invite the Parliament to consider the issue of legislative consent if the UK Government reserves the right to set aside its view for all Brexit-related bills. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I had intended to start in this conversation this morning with a question from myself on Common Frameworks, but you have, for, for your own understandable reasons, you have concentrated on issues to do with Sewell and consent. Patrick Harvey had questions in that area. So, Patrick, I'm going to come to you first on this occasion. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I, I had expected this to come up a little later as well. It's a, a question about the statement that you gave or, or comments that you made uh, before the summer recess at uh, the second half of June this year, uh, saying that uh, in relation to the embedding of the consent uh, mechanism into legislation, uh, you intended to uh, provide detail of legislation at an early stage in the new session, and I expect the legislative process to get underway shortly thereafter. Um, so there wasn't any uh, suggestion of, of that in the, the programme for government. In fact, it, it suggested uh, that the government, the Scottish government, would wait until the end of the negotiations uh, to uh, set out our judgment on the best way forward at that time. Uh, can I just ask, does that earlier intention to, to set out specific proposals still stand, and when would we expect to hear back? Uh, uh, so, sorry, could I could just proposal about Sewell? My understanding is that that would comment about the, the embedding of the consent okay. mechanism into legislation. Okay. We, we cannot ourselves embed it in our own legislation. Clearly, this is a matter for uh, legislation that will cover devolution as a whole. Uh, what I'm saying today is that I believe I'm putting ideas, or a set of ideas, to uh, David Liddington, to the UK government, about what change would free up this situation uh, in order to, for us to allow... Uh, in order to allow us to operate the, the convention again. And essentially, this lies, as I've indicated in my opening remarks, in the area of ensuring that there is a clarity about what is being asked for and how it's being asked for. You cannot ask for legislative consent um, for any part of a bill, get to the stage where that legislative consent is refused, and then say, well, it didn't matter because we're going to do it anyway. So what we need to have embedded in legislation is a process that both defines when and when not legislative consent is required, and in the circumstances that it is required, make sure that it is then binding, so if consent is not given, then that is, that is final. So that's the proposal that we're making, and uh, we hope to discuss that with parties here, including yourself. Uh, as you know, we have a meeting this afternoon to, to look at some issues, and this, I hope, will be one of them. And I have written, or I'm in the process of writing that letter, will be provided today, and then I hope to discuss that tomorrow. If, uh, if Mr Liddington or the, or the UK Government don't respond positively to that and, and don't intend to, to legislate on this in the near future, would the Scottish Government's intention be to publish legislation and seek the support of members of, of either House at Westminster to debate specific proposals? It's a good point. I'm, I'm certainly prepared to consider that. Um, but at the present moment, there is a, an ongoing process about looking at intergovernmental relations. At the last JMC plenary, and I think members of the committee know this, I think this has been referred to, there was an agreement that the intergovernmental relations would be reviewed. That was agreed by the Prime Minister, so I find it surprising that there didn't seem to be that indication from the Secretary of, Scot Secretary of State for Scotland last week. Um, nothing really much has happened, uh, as the official who was with me last week at the um, uh, Europe Committee confirmed. I think officials have met to discuss it once. Uh, there is a view from the Welsh Government and from ourselves that that needs to be given some push and urgency. 
Welsh Government have published proposals. We published proposals on devolution in Scotland's place in Europe in December 16. We've got more proposals here. So uh, you know, an, an issue that will undoubtedly arise tomorrow and will continue to arise is for the UK Government to put some urgency and push behind this. And indeed, the PAC Act report pushes that as well. So let's try and see whether we can move on that. But I am entirely open to publishing or, or drawing up legislation if that was an effective way of moving forward. Thank you. Adam, you've got a, a supplementary <coughs> consent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to understand, Minister, you know, exactly where we are in terms of um, the, you know, the disagreement between the two governments about the extent to which the SEAL Convention was adhered to in the passing of the Withdrawal Act. And, and, I, and I don't yet fully understand why... I mean, I understand that you are disappointed that the legislation was passed without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. I am also disappointed that the consent of this Parliament was not given to the passing of that legislation. But I, I don't yet really understand the constitutional and legal basis for your position, Minister, that the Seal Convention was not adhered to. So can I just yeah. walk you through it so that I can uh -huh. perhaps begin to understand it? Now, the starting point um, is Section 28 of the Scotland Act. And Section 28 of the Scotland Act provides in subsection 7 um, that this legislation uh, does not affect the power of the Parliament of the United Kingdom to make laws for Scotland. And you referred to that, I think, in your opening remarks. And it is then added um, in subsection 8 uh, that it is recognised that the Parliament of the United Kingdom will not normally legislate with regard to devolved matters without the consent of the Scottish Parliament. And that's the statutory recognition of the, what has um, been called uh, the Sewell uh, Convention. And, and I just don't understand, I'm afraid, what, what in the process of the enactment of the Withdrawal Act, um, uh, what in that process was not compliant with both the letter and the spirit of those statutory provisions, which are the statutory provisions which govern all of us. Okay. Well, let me give you an illustration of why I think that it was not adhered to. Uh, in the Northern Ireland Budget Bill, uh, there was a declaration by the UK government at the very start of the process that this, these were not normal circumstances and therefore it would legislate without the consent of the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, if there had been, at the start of the process in the Withdrawal Bill, a declaration by the UK government that it was not intending to seek legislative consent because these circumstances were not normal, then I would reluctantly agree with you. I think that you know, this is one of these circumstances where there needs a substantial re-examination. For example, I heard, uh, Carwin, I heard Carwin Jones say, if you'd allow me to finish, I heard Carwin Jones say on Saturday that he thought the, the, the myth of parliamentary sovereignty, Westminster parliamentary sovereignty, should be set aside forever. So this is not you know, a view only held by ourselves. But in those circumstances, what happened was the Westminster government, uh, Westminster government decided that it would request consent, so therefore, quite clearly, it believed these were normal circumstances. Uh, it requested consent, and only when that consent was refused did it say these were not normal circumstances. So it was the refusal of consent that created the lack of normality. I think that interpretation is very far from what any of us would have expected. Um, okay, so are you, are you really saying to us that there were no intervening um, uh, incidents in the... We're talking about legislation which took a year to be passed, right? The withdrawal bill was published in, I think, late June of 2017 and was enacted, I think, in early June of 2018. So we're talking about a legislative process that took a year. And during the course of that year, a number of things happened. One of the things that happened was that you introduced legislation into this parliament, which you then asked this parliament to enact under emergency procedure. And you said in, the, um, in your statement in the chamber here, um, uh, seeking the support of the parliament, which was given to you, to enact that legislation under, norm, uh, under emergency procedure, that these are not normal times. So there was a recognition, I think, by that point in the process, we're talking now, was this February of 2018, that the, you know, whatever, it, whatever one could say about the enactment of the legislation that is necessary in order to ensure that our statute books are compliant, are, you know, coherent um, after exit day, that this was no longer normal. And you, you said it yourself uh, three times uh, in that statement that these are not normal circumstances. So, you know, 
why, I, this is what I don't understand. I, I, mean, I, I don't understand how, um, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, now the position that you seem, you seem to be adopting is that, is, is that everything is normal unless the United Kingdom government says at the beginning of the process that something isn't normal. When, you know, we're talking about legislative processes which take months and months and months in which there are many actors, including yourself, um, and, and, and you said in this parliament, these are not normal circumstances. And you know, we reluctantly agreed with you. They aren't. They weren't normal circumstances. But you may have reluctantly agreed with me, but of course, the Secretary of State for Scotland uh, and the Secretary of State for Exiting the EU and the, um, uh, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster didn't agree with me because they didn't use those words specifically about their own bill. The, 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 the statute indicates that those words apply to the bill. So if they were, if at any stage, David Mundell or, or uh, uh, Damien Green and subsequently David Liddington or David Davis uh, had said, we now believe, in the light of what Mr. Russell has said, and I didn't know that I was that influential, uh, that this, this bill, this bill, the EU withdrawal bill, is therefore not normal, the circumstances, and therefore we are not seeking legislative consent, which is going to do it. That would have been understandable, <coughs> but they didn't do so. So I have to say the fact that I said it about a different bill does not apply to the bill in question. So uh, that is a basic disagreement between us on that issue. Last question for me about this. Do, do, do you think that the process of enacting the Withdrawal Act and the Continuity Bill counts as normal legislative process? It, it doesn't matter whether that, what I think at all. The question is, this is a bill. It doesn't matter what I think in terms of the West. This is a bill, and you've quoted the Scotland Act, and you've quoted it quite accurately, very accurately, because you've quoted the statute, and what it normality means is applied to that bill. And that is what we are addressing in our proposal to David Livington. Because you have to say, in that piece of legislation, uh, that we are not seeking legislative consent, because this is not normal circumstances, just as the UK government did in the Northern Ireland Budget Bill. And th that cannot be ignored. And they did not do so. And they, they didn't attempt to do so. So to do it at the end of the process was clearly wrong and did not observe spirit or the letter of the sole process. Right. Patrick said you've got another supplementary. Is it is a short supplementary? Just, just very briefly, is it your position looking forward, not just thinking back about the, the EU withdrawal bill, that in the absence of that upfront comment uh, that circumstances are not normal and consent will not be sought, the problem is that this parliament will never know when it is asked for consent, whether that consent will be respected? Well, of course, because the definition of consent, as you know, is given as uh, both consent, as we understand it, withholding consent, or doing nothing at all. So, of course, we would be unable to know it. Now, you know, there could be the mother and father of all disputes at the moment at which the UK government says we are not seeking legislative consent for this bill at the outset. But that would be better than a situation to allow the whole process to go through, at no stage to indicate there's any other intention. Indeed, I believe the Secretary of State for Scotland kept saying that he, he didn't envisage circumstances in which the, 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 the legislation would be overruled, and then overruling it. That, that is against the spirit of Sewell. I believe it's against the letter of Sewell. It's against you know, democratic respect from the institutions. I know Angela Constance wanted to raise issues to do with IGR and the Cabinet Secretary introduced that into his narrative there. Do you want to deal with that, with that subject just now, Angela? I, I do. I think it would be quite timely, okay. uh, convener. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm very interested in intergovernmental relations uh, and how they could be improved in a, a spirit of respect and reciprocity. And you mentioned that the, the, the GMC has began to um, at least mute uh, this subject, although you know there's a need for uh, further uh, progress. And you also mentioned... Uh, the Public Administration Constitutional Affairs Committee report that was published in July that specifically said that after 20 years Whitehall still doesn't understand uh, devolution and that that goes against the principles of devolution but significantly it's also bad governance. So what I would like to ask you specifically um, is what is it that needs to change? You've mentioned uh, aspects of the legislative consent motion process but you know in terms of structures cultures, uh, intergovernment uh, agreements, um, and perhaps even you know, reciprocal political commitments? Well, you, know, you wouldn't disagree with me. I know that the, the best relationship would be one of, of equality, which comes from independence. 
Uh, but short of independence, then we have to look for solutions. Now, one of the barriers to those solutions is this, this view of, of absolute Westminster sovereignty, and that needs to be challenged. But even within that circumstance, we need to remember there is no hierarchy of governments and devolution. There's a hierarchy of parliaments. So the first thing is that the government, uh, the UK government, must operate with the Scottish government, with the Welsh government, the Northern Ireland executive when it's present, as equals, and recognise the roles that each have. Uh, and you know, therefore, the frameworks, and we'll come on to those, are an anathema in those circumstances if they're imposed, but quite understandable if they're negotiated and agreed. So it is that relationship of equality. But then I think you have to look at devolution and say, as, as I've said often, the, the weight of Brexit on devolution has shown that, that there are deficiencies and difficulties that need to be changed. And we had this conversation last week about where devolution would be going. And uh, uh, you know, the Welsh government have published on this, and we've published on this in the original spy document at the end of 2016, uh, in chapter five, I, th I think. Chapter four. Chapter four. Um, chapter four. See, I don't keep it by my bed every night. <laughs> uh, in chapter four, we looked at a range of issues, and they really divided into three. There were a set of rights um, which people have, which we wanted to protect, which we are, you know, we are concerned that the UK government may not protect them in future. Employment rights, human rights, environmental rights. So we want to make sure that we have the ability to, to, to deal with those. There are a number of powers that we would need to have in order to operate effectively in the new regime, and trade was one which we've outlined in the trade paper, but there are a range of others. And then there's a third area, which we, you know, we've, has not been greatly discussed, but needs to be thought of, and that's legal personality. Because ensuring that the, you know, Scotland and the Scottish Parliament has legal personality would allow us to enter into agreements in the way that the devolved parliaments in, in Belgium have that responsibility. So there, is, there are a range of proposals which we can put on the table. There are a range of ideas from Wales. They're very keen on the idea of a, of a council of ministers, again, of, of equals. Uh, mirroring, in a sense, the Council of Ministers that exists in the EU, but post-Brexit, having a Council of Ministers that dealt with uh, areas which would be covered by frameworks. And that's a, worth discussing. They go into some detail about voting and qualified majority voting and all sort of ways to, to deal with it. What really, I think, is concerning, and you have the PAC Act report saying it doesn't work, there are no ideas coming from the UK, none whatsoever. And actually, the, the impetus for this is all coming from the devolved administrations. Now, that indicates to me two things. One is, I think it was true what David Cameron said, that the UK government devolved and forgot. You know, there are whole swathes of the UK government. There are whole you know, groups of ministers who've never dealt with devolution and don't understand it. You know, some of us are long in the tooth. You know, we, we, we grew up with the ideas you know, 21 years ago yesterday. There was a devolution referendum. We're still around. We understand how it works. Uh, we, we want to move on, but we understand how it works. There actually aren't very many people in the UK government, uh, and not many people in the civil service, actually, who understand it in the, uh, and, and respect it. So that needs to change. The second thing that needs to happen is that there needs to be an understanding of equality. Uh, again, I, you know, I note that the, uh, four years ago, at this time when the, the independence campaign was on, there were many assurances given about powers and about equality and particularly about partnership. And those need to be honoured and they're not being honoured at the present moment. Okay, thank you. Okay, you mentioned common frameworks. So I think we'll go into that ground now, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Secretary of State gave evidence last week to this committee that despite a number of and despite a number of invitations to do so, he was unable to confirm that common frameworks will not be imposed on the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament. I'd like to, for your record, to have your response to that. And also, uh, Mr. Mandel indicated that good progress was being made on common frameworks. Again, for the record, can we have your response to that, please? Yes, <coughs> I made it very clear. I think I did it again at this committee last week. That, you know, on the basis of working together, then we will work on frameworks. And indeed, the work of the civil servants, the officials on both sides of those frameworks proceeds. Uh, you know, there, is, there is clearly understanding of what is needed to be done. But where there is imposition, then we will not cooperate, because that does not respect the, 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 the partnership. It, it assumes a hierarchy of devolution in terms of governments, which does not exist. So I'm very happy to continue with the discussions that are going on. I've made it absolutely clear that we will do so. But imposition will be you know, something that we cannot accept. Uh, now, I'm sorry Mr. Mandel could not commit himself uh, about that matter, but I'm very clear about it. You know, as long as there's no imposition, then the discussion will continue. 
And he also said, as I said, that, that good <coughs> progress was being made in terms of discussions around common frameworks. Yes, I mean, what, what's your perspective on yes, that? Yes, I mean, there is continued discussion and there is progress on frameworks, and we are able to put in place frameworks effectively as things go on. Where frameworks move into legislation, there will be greater difficulties. We are committed not to giving uh, legislative consent, as you know, because of, of, of the circumstances we're in. Uh, there are also issues that will arise as bills are published. The Agriculture Bill will be published today. Issues have arisen there. But we are continuing to try and make sure the voluntary discussion works. And all voluntary discussion works on the basis that nobody has a veto, but everybody is trying to get a solution. And that's what we're trying to do. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Did you still have some outstanding question on common frameworks? Uh, just one or two specifics, uh, and it might be that the, the Cabinet Secretary would want to, to write to us after if he's not able to give specific answers just now. But uh, obviously, environmental governance is one of the areas where common frameworks will be discussed and, and decisions need to be reached about to what extent those matters are dealt with on a common basis across the UK uh, and to what extent they're dealt with separately. Um, there have been calls, for example, for either a UK-wide regulator or, or environmental watchdog agency or for individual country uh, level bodies to be established uh, within the countries of the UK uh, to take on some of the functions that are currently held at European level. Also proposals for the UK to seek continued membership of the European Environment Agency, which does include some non-EU uh, states. Can you give us an update on to what extent agreement has been reached on those issues? Because I'm aware of, of people, stakeholders in the, in, the, in the field of environmental policy who are not yet seeing any clarity on that. Yeah, I would like to write to you about that. I think it's appropriate I seek information from the relevant officials and from the Cabinet Secretary, but we will write to you with, with detail on that. Uh, one point I would make, however, in terms of membership of the European Environment Agency, and it's a general point, not a specific point, we, could, we are interested in ensuring continued presence and continued involvement in a range of agencies as those opportunities arise. And obviously, we, we, we look at that positively if we can. But I think it would be far better to get you the, the latest position, and we will write to the committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I know I'm going to exhaust as many issues as I can on the bill, and we'll go to wider issues, uh, uh, Cabinet Secretary. So I think, Emma, I think... Uh, PGIs, mm -hmm. is that part of the bill? Sorry, I'm, I'm there now. PGIs. Okay, thank you, convener. Um, good morning. Um, my question is about protected geographical indicator status of our produce in Scotland and actually wider in the UK. And last week, uh, the Trade Minister George Hollingbury said that some countries regard these PGI indications as non tariff barriers to trade. And he said there was no question that Scotch whisky would carry some sort of GI because they are easily counterfeited and need to be protected. And then he went on to talk about Japanese and South Korean markets, which was interesting because I was focusing on EU protected GI status, which we currently have agreement over. But he said that he talked about market penetration and different issues. So it was kind of interesting how his information was different than David Mundell, who gave us information on the, the following day, basically said the intention was that GI uh, status would remain exactly as they are and that we would have such arrangements in any future trade deals. So I'm interested in the differing, differing opinions, the information that's coming out and even a reluctance from the UK government to give assurances over the future of GI status. But uh, can you, Cabinet Secretary, tell us about any discussions you've had about protecting our GI status. I was concerned. I saw the Trade Minister's evidence, and I was concerned. He seemed very down on Ayrshire cheese, for example, that apparently wasn't penetrating the Japanese market enough. Uh, speaking as somebody who was brought up in Ayrshire, I regret that. I think the Japanese are missing out on, on, a, on a treat. Um, I was concerned about the, the, the dichotomy in, in view. My understanding is that there has been a strong commitment made to the food and drink industry that PGI status will be maintained. However, I did note yesterday some concern from James Withers, the Chief Executive of Scottish Food and Drink, uh, that that would not be the case. It is really important that the PGI status is maintained. The simplest way to do so, so, apart from staying in the EU, which would clearly still be the logical thing to do, would be to make sure that in any <coughs> um, exit agreement and future relationship agreement, there was an understanding of the continuation of a PGI scheme that worked for both sides. Uh, now, I, I think I would hope that sense would prevail upon this. The risks of getting this wrong are very great. And if the trade minister himself is not committed 
to PGI status across the board, then I do think we have a very serious problem. So we will continue to argue for PGI status, not just for Scottish whisky, not just for Scottish beef and Scottish lamb, but for the other things that are of extreme importance. I mean, the cheeses, uh, and also, if I may mention it, the stone away black pudding, the Arbroath Smokies, which are very important and which need to be recognised. And if the Trade Minister won't, we will. There's even a PGI process that's in place mm -hmm. right now for Scottish wild venison. Yes. And so that was uh, May this year. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming that will be delayed. As well, I think it's unlikely. I mean, I can't speak for, for, for the absolute veracity of this, whether or not that will be completed or not. Uh, but it would seem unlikely to me that it will be completed at this stage. Okay. But it may, it may well be. And I you know, commend the Scottish wild venison because you know, our, our guile is a strong producer of Scottish wild venison. It's very important. Okay. Right. We're straight into the trade bill. I know there's one other question I'm aware that someone's got in the trade bill, and I'm going to come back and finish bill issues with Adam Tompkins on the EU withdrawal bill before we move on to the wider issues. George, you had a question, I think, on LCMs in the trade bill? Uh, no, no, we've moved on anyway. We've moved on, OK. For, for, uh, apologies if I've missed an opportunity to bring in Adam Tompkins. Thanks, Camina. Um, uh, Minister, I wanted to ask you what you meant um, in your statement yesterday um, when you said of the EU Withdrawal Act and I quote that this government will have nothing to do with that legislation. That's what you said. This government will have nothing to do with the EU Withdrawal Act. Well, it, I no, say with can reference can to ask, can Section I, can, 12. Can I, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. now, the EU Withdrawal Act is the law of the land, whether we like it or not. So what did you mean when you said that this government will have nothing to do with the law of the land? Uh, just what I've been saying about Section 12. Section 12 orders, uh, if they are uh, uh, operated, we will not cooperate with them because... We, do, we believe that frameworks should be voluntary and not uh, enforced upon us. OK, and just for the record, is it, in your view, or is it not normal for a government in this country to say that it will have nothing to do with the law of the land? Uh, I think in the context of my statement, it was not only normal uh, and necessary, but well understood, obviously, with exceptions. I don't understand what that means. Can you clarify that, please? I think it's clear what I mean. OK. Um, we move on to impact on the budget in general terms of the of the exit of the European Union. James. Okay, um, thank you, convener. So we're uh, less than 200 days from exit day and also less than 200 days from the start of the 2019-20 financial year, you know, where the, the budget will kick in. Uh, we're weeks away from the publication of the Scottish budget. Um, you've rightly warned in a, a number of speeches and interventions about the, the impact on Brexit on the Scottish economy on in public services. So, can I repeat the question asked you in the chamber yesterday? What assessment has the Scottish government made of the impact of Brexit in relation to the 2019-20 draft budget? Uh, well, well, Mr. Kelly, I, I, I'm, I'm going to repeat my answer more or less, but I, I want to expand upon it a little because I'm not being difficult about this in, in any sense. I understand the question. I understand it will have an impact. We have published, for example, figures that show the impact on the Scottish economy of the various types of Brexit going forward. So those figures are in the public domain, both in Scotland's Place in Europe 1 and in the second version we published earlier this year. And we will continue to update that. So there is a sort of macro publication that indicates what the impact would be on Scotland and, and what we're doing. Um, but th there are also the issue of consequentials to the budget for the additional costs that we are meeting, and I addressed that in the statement yesterday. I gave a clear indication of where that money was being spent, uh, uh, and, and I indicated that further information would become. Now, we don't have knowledge of future consequentials, obviously, but that would be of, of impact. On the third issue, just to focus on the narrower consequence of the, the actual impact on the coming year's budget, I cannot... Uh, you know, uh, uh, say what that situation will be. That is properly for the, the Cabinet Secretary to say. I can give you an assurance that he is l looking at that. That will be an issue within the budget. But just as we are not absolutely clear yet about the legislative impact, there are a huge range of issues uh, which would produce an impact from any scenario of Brexit. Let me give you an example. Uh, if you were to have a no-deal Brexit, then clearly there would be a range of, of immediate costs uh, which would be very difficult to quantify uh, in, in the short term. If there was to be a softest of Brexit in terms of the, 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 the customs union and the, the, uh, and the single market, then there would be a very much reduced cost in that, but it would still be impact because you would have to quantify, for example, issues such as labour shortage and how that would impact on, on the budget. So 
I can give you an, a, a commitment that that work continues. It is very difficult to estimate, but it continues. I can give you a commitment that the Cabinet Secretary will address that uh, in his, both, in, I presume, in his budget itself, but also in his discussions with opposition parties. And I would draw your attention to the published papers, which contain information upon the impact upon Scotland. Well, ju ju just to be clear, in terms of the scenarios that you've outlined, are you saying that the Scottish Government has assessed them directly in terms of the impact on the Scottish budget in relation to revenues and spending? No. What I'm saying is that the scenarios that we've outlined are quantified within Scotland's Place in Europe, both publications, indicated what the effects will, there will be, and the Scottish Government will uh, uh, undoubtedly report upon that uh, 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 as time passes and we know what is going to take place upon the impact on the budget. Okay, that's what I'm saying. But bear in mind the, the budget is going to be published before the end of the year. Uh, are you able to detail what work is carrying out, has been carried out directly in relation to the publication of that budget and the impact uh, on the various spending? I am quite budget. sure Mr Mackay will want to be uh, as comprehensive as he can be about the work that's being done and its implications. I'm, I'm not trying to avoid this, but this is Mr. Mackay's responsibility. He is the person bringing the budget forward. You, you as a you know, budget spokesperson, you know, uh, uh, will be in negotiation with him about these matters. That is the right way to do it. I can't go into the details of or the impacts on the budget here and now. That has to be done by Mr. Mackay. We move on to a, a different area now. Uh, and Willie, I think you wanted to have a discussion about the Chequers deal. Yeah, thanks very much, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, last week, uh, Mr Mundell told us the Chequers deal was still on the table. Uh, and shortly after this, we heard Boris Johnson, and he's, he's ranting, describing it as a suicide vest, where he, we hand the detonator to, to Brussels. And then shortly after that, a former Brexit minister said Mrs May faced a tremendous amount of political crisis and rupture if she doesn't ditch the Chequers plan. Now, with that kind of loyal support within her own party, do you not think it's time that the Tories stopped their internal civil war and started applying their attention to getting to avoiding a no deal scenario for, for Brexit? Well, I, I think to be charitable to all sides of the civil war, it's been going on for 40 years. It's not likely to come to an end this week, you know. But that's where we are. There is this civil war. We are, to a sense, collateral damage in that civil war. Everybody is, you know, while it's going on. And it's very, very damaging indeed and very irresponsible. I think what we have to do in looking at the Chequers deal is to try and understand where it is now and where it might go. And, you know, there's two conflicting views of the Chequers deal that exist. There's one from you know, the Prime Minister and, and, and various others who have spoken publicly about it, which it is essentially fully formed. That's it. You know, it's on the table. This will be accepted, and that's going to go forward. Now, nobody, believe, apart from the Prime Minister and those around her, believe that that is the case. You know, I've, I've heard civil servants and others talk about evolving and this deal evolving. And that's where the crucial question is, seriously. How, how can this deal evolve into something which can produce a high-level agreement, a sort of blind Brexit? And remember, this is about exit, right? You know, we, this is not the end. It is not, if I may be allowed this, it's not even the beginning of the end. It, it is, might be the end of the beginning, you know, because once this exit has been agreed, there is then the whole question of the future relationship to be decided. And that's actually the hard thing. So the really depressing thing I have said this morning, and I know Mr. Thompson, Thompson accused me of going around spreading gloom, is actually there are years of this ahead. Because we're only trying to deal with the exit now. When we actually start to try and deal with the reality of the future relationship, this is going to be even worse. But where we are at the moment is can checkers produce the high level, the blind Brexit agreement, that will allow the, Tories, the Tory, present Tory government off the hook, even with their own supporters, uh, and get them through until next year. Um, and the question is, can they move to that, or will they be stopped moving to that by, uh, by the Brexiteers, those people who were appearing um, and presenting a completely half-baked report yesterday in the, in the House of Commons? And the answer is we don't know, because the answer to that lies in the internal Tory party shenanigans. It doesn't lie in anything to do with Brexit or, or anything to do with negotiation. It lies to whether she is able to move. Now, you know, last night, Robert Peston was reporting on you know, a group of Tory MPs openly talking about getting rid of her. So how can we have any confidence in this process at all? 
you know, yesterday afternoon while I was delivering my statement, there were members of the Tory front bench shouting about something Michel Barnier is alleged to have said yesterday. Uh, Michel Barnier was saying something else last night. You know, so clutching at straws is what most of the Tories are doing presently. What they should be doing, and you're not wrong about this, is actually sorting out their own house and then looking at, and actually being ashamed of the mess they've made of this. I mean, last week, Mr Mundell also said Mr Barnier wasn't to be believed about dismissing the Chequers deal, but we know he said and in the last few days that a deal might be possible in six to eight weeks, but do we know what, whether he actually meant the Chequers deal? Well, well, I think really quite fascinatingly, uh, Barnier's uh, number two said something quite fascinating last week in the midst of a row as to what he had actually said to the EU exit committee and in which language he had said it. Uh, he, he, he indicated, I think, uh, rather interestingly, that this told you not much about what Mr Barney had said, but a lot about the current state of British politics. And it is. It is just constant obsession with every statement uh, swings one way, swings the other way. There might have been. There just might have been a good way to do this. I don't think so, because I think leaving the EU is the wrong thing to do. There might have been a good way to do this. But this is the worst possible, most incompetent way you could possibly imagine. And the responsibility for that lies fairly and squarely with the current UK government and the Conservative Party. Thank you. Murdo. Uh, thank you, Convener. Well, maybe we can cut through the party politics and get back to talking about the business of government. We've, we've, we've heard over the last few days some commentary around uh, the Chequers deal from various stakeholders. The National Farmers Union for Scotland said uh, on Monday, and it's a direct quote, it is important that politicians of all parties put their shoulder to the wheel and secure something as close to the Chequers Agreement as possible. If we step away from that, it will be detrimental to the UK and Scotland. We heard similar comments last week from the CBI in Scotland about the uh, Chequers deal. And obviously, other stakeholders like the Fishermen's Federation have been supportive of what the UK government are trying to achieve. So wh why is the, the Scottish government not listening to these important stakeholders in the Scottish economy and Scottish society, and instead carrying on this posturing that we've heard this morning? Well, let me start on the business of government. With the greatest respect, Mr Fraser, if the UK government was doing the business of government, we wouldn't be in this mess. On the issue of uh, the Chequers Agreement, the words close to are interesting. The CBI, by the way, I'm quite happy that people read the CBI uh, uh, president, um, president's statement from last week. It does not endorse the Chequers deal by any manner of means. But in terms of the position close to the, close to the Chequers Agreement, you know, uh, the closest you could get would be to have, uh, that would be acceptable, would be single market and customs union membership. Now, customs union membership is halfway in there. Single market membership is not in there, except possibly in goods in a totally false uh, 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 split. What I want to see is the best possible deal for Scotland. Uh, and that's what I'm going to continue to argue for. And I'm not going to uh, you know, hide the fact that the Chequers Agreement, it will not fly. It won't fly. We know it won't fly. So how can it change? No, and the, and the NFU has not said it will fly. So how can it change to provide the basis for a solution? And that's the issue. How can it change? And, and you know, until that is agreed, and until there's an agreement to change it, to get to the stage where there's an agreement, then there's no point having this discussion. It has to change. So is it evolving or is it settled? That's the issue that needs to be resolved. And presently, there are two sides saying different things. And you know, the final thing on this, I, I really do have to say, Given the internal warfare in the Tory party that is creating this enormous instability, where business after business is complaining. Last night, the chief executive of Jaguar Land Rover making an unequivocal statement about this, then I think it behoves the Conservative Party to listen, rather than to try and pretend that everything is fine, because it isn't fine. If there's a vote in the House of Commons on the Chequers deal, what do you expect your Westminster colleagues to do? Will they vote it down? As I said yesterday in my statement, and I'm happy to repeat it, it's a false distinction. No, no, no. no, no it's a very no, simple I, question that needs a yes or no, no answer. No, it doesn't. And if it's there's not a going vote to, and it's not in the House of get... Commons on the Chequers deal, will your SNP MPs support it? It is not or going to get down? a yes or no answer, because the reality is there are a range of possible options that will take place. The much more likely uh, vote will be between a blind Brexit, 
which we do not know what is going to happen, a high-level statement that goes nowhere, uh, or the madness of just opting out. The reality is what everybody should be supporting, and we'll go on arguing for it, as my colleagues in the Commons have been gone on arguing for it, is at the very, very least there should be single market and customs union membership. But we're not going to be put in the position... We're not the going to put, deal, we're not it doesn't going, support that... We are not going to be put in the position okay. of, of backing a Prime Minister okay. whose actions upon these matters have been disgraceful, okay. nor we will be in a position of betraying the people of Scotland who voted to stay, question, who Russell, voted to stay in the EU. Yeah. In all those circumstances, we will do the best thing for Scotland. Yeah, so it is home. not being the midwife of Brexit. Brexit is a disaster for Scotland, and Mr Fraser, you know that. You've and answered my question, time, Mr Russell. It's about Thank you time much. you recognise it. You will vote it, it down. Thank you. Yeah, we're through that a little bit. Neil. <laughs> The Secretary of State for Scotland last week was uh, reluctant to share with the committee um, details on the specific sectors of the Scottish economy that the UK government believe uh, will be hardest hit by a no-deal Brexit. Has the UK government provided details of that to the Scottish government? Yeah. Uh, the uh, publication of information from the UK government uh, you know, includes the analysis they made, which is similar to our analysis, actually slightly gloomier. But in terms of specific uh, a, a, a areas of the economy, no, that information, I, I don't know whether it exists. It certainly hasn't been shared with us. You mentioned there's a difference in the analysis um, by, between the Scottish Government and the UK Government. Yesterday, you referred to the No Deal technical notes. Um, what, what areas, if any, are there a difference of opinion on the details set out in the technical notes between the Scottish Government and the UK Government? Well, uh, you know, the technical notes deal with what you might call often wishful thinking. Um, you know, there are whole areas in the technical notes which say this is what we will need to do, but it would be contingent upon the EU saying that they would do this. You know, there, the, 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 some of the technical notes is very often sort of like small deals. Within an overall no-deal scenario, there will be small deals. You know, an example would be <coughs> rolling over the aviation agreements. Though, as you know, yesterday, uh, uh, Dominic Raab got a, a, a bit of a, I think, an ear, 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 tongue lashing for having tried to set that up with all the 27 without going through the negotiating process. So a lot of those are, are small-scale deals that require European agreement. Now, there is no such agreement. So at the very least, we should be sceptical as to whether these can stick. You know, we, we've agreed that we will fact-check those in terms of Scots law and any information that relates to Scotland. And we've tried to do so. We haven't seen all of them, um, you know, and, and therefore we can't fact-check them all. But we're not endorsing this policy view. We're passing it on, and we're, you know, we're saying it's important that this stuff exists. But as to whether th these arrangements would work, I don't think anybody knows. You know, I mean, some of them clearly might, and some of them probably wouldn't. Uh, and that's the difficulty of the situation. The New Deal scenario, and, and you know, th this needs to be understood, should be ruled out. And it can be ruled out in two different ways. It can be ruled out by simply saying, in the event of a no deal scenario, we will seek to continue single market and customs union membership you know, for the foreseeable future. That's one way. The other way it can be ruled out is by seeking an extension of the Article 50 process, that actually making that an automatic uh, trigger, that if you couldn't come to a deal, you would say to the EU, well, we want to, we want to suspend the Article 50 process while we work this out. Both of those things are quite legitimate and could be said. Why they are not being said, I, I, I don't understand. Instead, the Prime Minister keeps saying that it wouldn't be a, you know, it wouldn't be the end of the world. It wouldn't be a disaster. Well, it will be. It will be. It won't be the end of the world, but it'll be a difficult set of circumstances. Very difficult. I think further detail on the Scottish government's um, response to those technical notes in terms of the, the fact checking and other comments on on the technical notes would be uh, welcome. Um, I'll, you, I'll certainly note yeah. that. I'm not adverse to providing that. That'd be great. Um, you, 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 you said you published Scotland's Place in Europe and other statements. Can I just ask, in, in terms of you know, transparency, will you publish all papers that you've commissioned on the impact of Brexit and the preparations that are being made by the Scottish Government? Well, I, but I, I'm not going to make a commitment to that because I'm not sure what that list is. You know, I mean, I, we will publish what we write, you know, and we've prepared, I think, 16 papers up until now, one sort or another. I, I need to give you the list. I'll provide the list to you. Uh, we have an extensive list of papers that we've published, uh, you know, and we will continue doing so. I and mean, we're planning to publish more in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for coming and giving us evidence this morning. Thank you. Very grateful to you. I now suspend this meeting till I change over witnesses.
Thank you, colleagues. Uh, the next item on today's agenda is to take evidence from the Scottish Fiscal Commission on the forecast evaluation report. This session forms part of our 2019-20 pre-budget scrutiny. Uh, thank you very much for sending us uh, the report, I, th I think, and also the very useful summary which was with it. Uh, so I welcome to, to the meeting um, Dame Susan Rice, who is the chair of the Scottish Fiscal Commission, Professor Alistair Smith, the Commissioner, and John Ireland, who is the Chief Executive. But before we, we move to questions, I wonder if Dame Susan Rice would like to make any opening remarks. Convener, thank you very much. Good morning. And once again, I thank the committee for inviting us. It feels like just yesterday that we were last here talking to you about our summer forecast. Uh, we hope that you've all had a good summer, as we have. And last Wednesday, we published three reports. The first was our annual forecast evaluation. The second, a paper on our approach to forecasting assigned revenue from VAT. The third, our statement of, of data needs. And yesterday, we also published our first costing to accompany the social, the social Security secondary legislation for the Best Start grant. I'll focus my comments just now on income tax, the economy forecast, and our data needs. We're required by legislation to produce an annual evaluation of our forecast. This is something actually that we do anyway, because looking back at forecasts and how they performed against outturn data is one of the best ways in which forecasters can improve. As we state in our report, there are many reasons for differences or errors. Forecasting is not an exact science. This is especially the case when we're dealing with economic statistics that are often revised and with some of the newly devolved taxes where the tax authorities are still establishing the baselines for receipts. In Scotland, it's even more dynamic as we observe data and trends often for the first time because things are still forming here. We've tried to be fair and self-critical of our work and transparent about the way that we've evaluated it. We've also compared our forecast errors to those of similar organizations such as the OBR. We find that overall our forecast errors are within the ranges that we would expect by looking at the track record of others. This evaluation was the first opportunity we've had to compare our own forecasts produced in December and May this year Last, December last year, May this year, against the economic and fiscal data. The relatively short period since we produced them means that we're only looking at our in-year forecasts. This means that uh, we're talking about forecasts for the fiscal year 17-18. Next year, we'll be able to revisit these forecasts looking at the track record for the current year as well, meaning 18-19. One exception to this timing, however, is that income tax, as the most recent data released in July, is for the earlier fiscal year of 16-17. And we've, we've all have to just keep that difference in mind. You may recall that there's an 18-month lag as a result of self-assessment. Now, this is the first ever release of Scottish non-savings, non-dividend income tax outturn data, and it follows HMRC's Scottish taxpayer identification exercise and actually represents something of a milestone in the devolution story. When we produced our forecast in May, the survey of personal incomes was the best available source of information on income tax liabilities in Scotland. This survey is based on a sample of UK administrative records held by HMRC with postal addresses used to infer who would be a Scottish taxpayer. The most recent version of the survey is for 1516. So in May, in our forecast, we projected income tax liabilities from the fiscal year 1617 um, through to 23-24. Now that we have the new data, which were released in July, we can see that our survey-based projection for 1617 had a 550 million pound overestimate of receipts. Our analysis suggests that this is primarily driven by the actual number of higher and additional rate taxpayers being lower, so the number of that group of taxpayers being lower than the survey of personal incomes had suggested. As these numbers date from before any changes were made to Scottish income tax bans and rates, we believe the differences are driven by data rather than by a behavioral response by taxpayers. I know you'll be concerned about the potential impact of this new information on the Scottish Government's budget. The new receipts data refer to the fiscal year 1617, as I've said, and this is the baseline year under the fiscal framework and will change the initial deduction for the block grant adjustment for income tax. Therefore, there should be no direct impact on the budget. 
but we can discuss that more if you'd like. You'll see that we've also evaluated our forecast of the other taxes in our remit, including non-domestic rates, Scottish landfill tax, LBTT. I won't say any more about those now. Turning next to our economic forecast, the official statistics were revised significantly following our May forecast. Economic growth for the fiscal year, 1718, was revised up from 0.8 to 1.3%. This was mainly due to some very large revisions in the estimates of construction activity. Our May forecast of the year 1718 was zero growth was 0.7% and this now looks too low. At that point, we had three quarters of official data quite consistent with each other and those data suggested only modest growth. While we were aware that revisions to these data were likely, we held the view that the statisticians in the Scottish government, whose job it is to produce the statistics, were best placed to measure and revise their estimates of economic growth. While the revised data show stronger growth in the year 1718 than previously thought, the average growth since uh, the beginning of the decade, since 1011 and beyond, has fallen slightly. Our view is that there's no evidence from this revision to suggest that we should change our analysis of our underlying uh, view of subdued trends in the economy. I shall finish by saying a few words about data more generally. Following its inquiry, the Economy, Jobs and Fair Work Committee recommended earlier this year that we publish an annual statement of our data needs. As my comments above illustrate, good data are fundamental to good forecasts. On balance, we've seen progress in the provision of data, although there's more that can be done. We are concerned, though, about our access to data from the UK Department for Work and Pensions. We don't currently have an agreed way of obtaining access to the data that we require, and our most recent request for information, uh, public body to public body, was treated as a freedom of information request. While we received this information, um, just in time for us to uh, be able to examine it. It places us in an uncertain situation with regard to future data requests. So that, I hope, has been a helpful overview of our work, um, which made for us a busy as well as a good summer. And now we're very happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your opening statement. Can I just pick up on that last point you made, because about data and not being able to secure that from the DWP, and you said, I think, that they treated your request as a freedom of information request. And that seems to me somewhat surprising, given they were trying to get the data to ensure that we have our own new social security system and, how, uh, and the payments around it in as secure a position as possible. I, I wonder, have you raised these matters with any other committee in the Scottish Parliament, uh, such as the Social Security Committee here, uh, in terms of trying to make sure that they're aware of that it seems to be, to me, quite a significant challenge you've just told us about. It, it, it is, uh, and it was a significant challenge. Um, this has happened in, in recent weeks, so um, the committee, I don't believe, has met. We have, however, been very active, uh, both in working with uh, colleagues uh, in the government and directly ourselves, talking to others in DWP, trying to help them understand our needs, um, our sense is that they, like all of big agencies, they have more and more work to do and probably not more people to do it, but they would prefer to take all requests from Scotland from the Scottish Government. The Commission, as you all know, acts independently and we have both a right and a need to request our own data. And uh, we've raised this, we're in conversations, but we do need to get this resolved. We need a, an agreement, a memorandum of understanding about how we work together, as we have with the other UK and Scottish uh, agencies. Now, I know this is not our primary responsibility, but in, in terms of this committee around the social security issue, but, you know, but this isn't like um, any other circumstance. And I know departments are busy, but this is a, a primary requirement for the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament yourselves. Um, and, I, I would, and, and it's not for me to say to you how to do your, your work, but I would have thought certainly writing to the committee here to let them know what's going on and also to the Scottish Government to uh, seek their help to secure a, an outcome as early as possible, I think would be a reasonable way forward for you. But I'll leave that with you. It's not, as I say, that's not for this committee to deal with. So forgive me for getting straying into that, but you did raise it. Um, you rightly said, Dame Susan Rice, that you, you, the, you, and you explained that HMRC have now published their Scottish income tax outturn data for 1617, uh, and that shows that there's some 
£550 million below the Scottish Fiscal Commission forecast for 1617. Um, you also said that that would have no impact on the budget. So, for the record, I just like it would be useful, I think, for everyone to understand why actually, while that, that shortfall is there or that forecast number has changed, why it will have no impact on the budget, I think would be a useful thing for people to understand. Um, it, it, 1617 is the baseline within the fiscal framework. So that's the base um, you know, from which we start. And really what the new data, and we hope is more accurate, more reflective data, will do as we all incorporate it is to give us a new baseline that will uh, carry forward. Um, because it's the baseline, it's also uh, the time when the initial block grant adjustment uh, will be made. So as one number changes, the other number changes, and it nets out without an actual impact on the on the budget. Um, yeah. Is yeah. that is yeah, that's that great, clear that's great enough? Useful, yeah. That's great. It's useful for the record, just so that we have that on at the beginning. Alex, convener, I just note my register of interest. Um, Good morning, Dame Susan. If I could, uh, a couple of questions. If I could start on one on construction. Um, as you mentioned in your opening statement and and in uh, the report, uh, there were significant revisions uh, around the uh, construction industry activity, uh, yeah, mostly resulting in problems in the measurement uh, of that. Uh, and you go on further in the report to say that these are by no means settled, uh, so we can maybe expect further uh, changes in that. Um, I suppose my uh, view is that really all my thoughts that. You know, this is, is symptomatic of a, uh, a larger failure to understand the pipeline of the construction sector, um, you know, which happens across Parliament with you know, infrastructure projects and, and, and the like. Um, and I just wonder how your analysis in that sector is improving uh, and how that might interact with other parliamentary analysis. Ah, so that's Alistair, I've been talking, you can take that one. Um, I, I, I'm not sure it's right, it's helpful to refer to our analysis of the construction sector data. We were aware, as other forecasters were, and indeed as the Scottish Government statisticians were, uh, that there were problems in the construction sector data. Um, it, it, it was hard to believe that they were quite accurate because they were jumping around so much. Um, but it, it's, uh, there are some inherent difficulties in, in cu counting what's going on in that sector from quarter to quarter. But it's really for uh, the Scottish Government statisticians to uh, do the best job that they can of producing the most accurate statistics. And what we've seen in this quarter is that having done that, they have decided that it's appropriate to have uh, an unusually large revision to bring the statistics into better line with what they, th they think is reality. Uh, and we have decided in that process that it's not really for us, even though we might have some uh, doubts about the credibility of a set of statistics, not really for us to get into the business of second-guessing the government statisticians and trying to do a job in parallel with them or trying to do their job for them. Uh, it's, it's sensible for us to take account of the uncertainties in the data, which indeed we did do, in the sense that in looking at our longer run projections in our report last December, uh, we decided to smooth the construction industry statistics so that the, their jumping around didn't affect our long, long run view. But in doing our short-run forecasts, we really had no better alternative than to uh, take the statistics as we were given and make our best forecasts on that basis. Uh, but obviously, we welcome uh, the fact that, uh, that there are now, hopefully, uh, more reliable statistics. And we, have now, uh, we will, uh, in our next forecast, be taking that into account. And so when you do see uncertainties in some of those statistics, which you then cater for in providing your analysis, is there a process where you feed back that back to the government statisticians so that they can maybe improve their statistics coming forward in future? Well, well I, think, I think the government statisticians knew that uh, everyone was everyone concerned with those statistics uh, knew that there were puzzles about the construction industry st st statistics, just if only, as I've said, because they were jumping around 
in, in a way that was hard to understand. So there was no need for us somehow to tell the Scottish Government statisticians what they already knew. Thank you. The uh, uh, second question uh, concerns the non-domestic rates um, in, in uh, Chapter 3, uh, Paragraph 39, uh, the uncertainty around uh, some of the resolution of appeals uh, from revaluations that took place before 2017. Um, you know, I have a number of constituency cases where uh, you know, appeals have been ongoing for, for longer than a year. I just wonder if you could elaborate maybe a little on uh, your assessment of, of, of that uh, further uncertainty. Uh, is, it a, is it around the quantum of appeals or the quantum of results? Or do you have any uh, anything to add to that? I'm not sure that we have much to add beyond what is in the report, except that this is an area where the numbers are quite volatile. Things happen at different points in the year. Um, there are, it's, it's a complicated suite of measures that are fed in. It's, it's not just about buoyancy. It's about a number of different things. Um, and we've seen, even in the old days of the non-statutory fiscal commission, numbers jumping uh, around. So uh, these will always move a lot. Uh, I'm not sure there's a way to address that. Uh, sometimes there are revisions in, in, in these data. There was a large wind farm um, where the basis changed and that made a three million difference. So it, these data are also affected by often a very small number of um, properties or, or entities which have a, a large value. John, I don't know if you want to add some detail to that. I think that's about as far as we can go in terms of sort of the, the nitty gritty of this. We, we, we work very closely with, with the, the Scottish Government statisticians um, and also the, the assessors um, who compile the role. Um, but as, as Susan has been saying that sort of during the course of the year there will be a number of appeals um, and we, 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 we track those. Um, we speak to the assessors to get their sense of where things are going. Um, but it, it is it's a very lumpy sort of process and you know, we try and keep on top of it but there are limits to what we can do. If I could add just, just one point, it is worth emphasising that although there is this inherently volatile element, or a number of inherently volatile elements in the non-domestic rates total, uh, and as Susan and John have just said, they're limited to what we can do to forecast and we just have to accept that those elements are, forecast, are, are a bit difficult to forecast. Nevertheless, the, the, the overall total of non-domestic rates is a pretty stable number. So we're talking about a, a bit of volatility on the top of a very big number. It's, it's not a, it's not a, numerically, it's not a huge yeah. issue uh, for the, uh, uh, as a forecasting issue. Thank you. Okay, Willie. Bruce, uh, it's on the income tax uh, issue again, uh, Dame Susan. Um, do you remember a couple of years ago, HMRC uh, failed to identify about 400,000 Scottish taxpayers and that, that led to some debate Certainly, this committee and others about their failure to even identify people who were liable to pay the Scottish rate of income tax. And now, now this circumstance has emerged here where there's quite a discrepancy between the two data sets leading to that uh, issue about £500 million pounds below forecast. Who's got the real data here and how, how can we know which one of the data sets we can believe to be accurate. What's going the, on? The, the previous data set was taking uh, sort of UK-wide data and then inferring by address that, you know, this cohort of these, these people um, must be because of the address uh, Scottish rate taxpayers. Um, they've now done, uh, taken a different look and a more, I suppose, sophisticated look at who might make up that pool. And, and that is the reason for the change now. This is a one-time change. This isn't a number that should flip back next year or the year after. They've taken, it's a completely different methodology now, and they've narrowed down um, who would be, remember, non-savings, uh, non-dividend, NSND, income tax payers in Scotland, so the, you know some people will pay other kinds of tax as well, and they've narrowed that down. John, you look yeah. at the, I just add that the, the data which, the, the outturn data which was published in July, that's based on the S code. So you remember on your page you weren't thinking of a little S, um, and in a sense that that's the definitive data. Um, and the, the, the issue in, in, in terms of the forecast um, evaluation was the, the mismatch between a sort of a, a statistical sampling of an earlier approach and that hard data about the S codes. Of course, there's another issue which might be, are all the Scottish taxpayers correctly identified with S-codes? But that, that, that's separate from the issue that we're talking about here. What, 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 uh, 
How can the public get any kind of sense of comfort that what you're dealing with? I mean, I don't envy your task here at all, but how, how on earth can we get any comfort that what we're dealing with is in any sense reliable? Because it's huge variations from time to time we're dealing with here, it seems. But, but I, I, I think uh, I'd just emphasise what John has already said, that we're not looking at two competing sources of data that are to be treated equally. Uh, and until this new data came from HMRC, we and others were working with data derived from a survey of personal incomes. Uh, and a survey is just a survey. Uh, the data that we now have is, is the HM, HMRC's classification of their taxpayers by S codes, and that's got a different kind of status. Uh, now, as John said, it might, it may still have some imperfections in it, but that is the, the definitive data. It's not that we're somehow jumping around between one, one and the other. The, the, the new data source is the one that we will be using as the base of our focus from now on. It's the one that o, OBR will be using. It's the one, as Susan was saying earlier, that will not, will underpin the block grant, grant assessment. So it is the definitive data source. Won't see any of these crazy fluctuations in the future. Oh, well, well, there will be some. <laughs> <laughs> we, we won't see the kind... The, the, the introduction of this new data source is a, a, cha a step change in the availability of data that's a, a one-off step change. And from the perspective of making good forecasts, it's a very welcome uh, one-off change. So, uh, and just to pick up one specific issue, one of the reasons for the change in the income tax forecast is quite a high proportion of income tax revenue comes from high-rate taxpayers. Uh, for various reasons that are set out, out in our report. The survey of personal incomes is not very good at identifying uh, accurately the number of high-rate taxpayers in Scotland, because for confidentiality reasons, there has to be a bit of, of aggregation of high-rate taxpayers in the, the survey data. Um, whereas the, the, new, the new source, the, the HMRC, outturn data, is identifying the high rate taxpayers with S codes. So it's a, a more definitive source. And for the purposes of forecasting income tax revenue, it's particularly important that we have a, a good handle on the number of high rate taxpayers, and we now do have a much better handle on that. But I think the HMRC are coming in front of the committee on the 3rd of October, so we'll get a chance really to ask them a bit more detail about how they came to that final outturn data. Um, description, but there is an interesting issue about the number of addresses identified in the survey process um, being much greater than the number of actual taxpayers. So I think there's an issue for HMRC to be picking up with that really for them. James, you're a supplementary in this area. Yeah, I do. Um, I mean, to an extent, I can understand how the discrepancies happen because the survey data that you were using was based on a very small sample of just sort of one to two percent. Um, and obviously the HMRC is the actual outturn out data based on all the data on their system. I suppose the issue is going forward. You know, at the minute we've identified um, that there have been nearly 30,000 less taxpayers than was in the original forecast. Um, and there's a, there's a lag between, you know, when, when we'll get the next HMRC outturn report for 2017-18. So my question is, in terms of the, the future forecasts that you're going to be doing, you know, later this year, for example, how are you going to tra uh, track uh, ch changes in that the, the number of taxpayers? How, you, how are you going to forecast that? So we we will take the the outturn data from 1617, um, and that gives us a very clear handle of. Um, the sort of the taxpayers then, and we'll project that forward. So we'll readjust our forecasting models so they use that as the baseline. Um, we'll know more in early next year when the, the, um, the SPI, the survey, is produced for the same year as the outturn data, so we can get an even better handle then. Um, but certainly for, for the December forecast, what we'll be doing is rebasing the, the, the forecasts um, and the number of taxpayers um, using that, sort of, that outturn data for 16, 17. So that should give us a far better and more accurate forecast. So what you're going to do is you're, you're going to take the number of taxpayers from the HMRC 1617 outturn report 
and you're going to fix that in terms of 1718, you're not going to make any adjustments to we that? We will make some adjustments. So we'll, we'll, we'll try and sort of project that forward. And at the moment, we're just working through the details of that because our, our, our tax forecasting model has um, a very detailed demographic split. Um, and we're just trying to work, work through how we'll actually use the, the, the relatively limited data we have from the, the outturn data, which is just by tax band, um, and how we'll fix that and, and, and merge that with our sort of quite rich demographic modeling. What would, what would be your basis of making some adjustments and changes? Because this is obviously quite sensitive, bearing in mind the, you know, the discrepancies that there have been in the additional and higher rate bands. So we, 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 we will take that sort of those numbers in those tax bands are, 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 are a pretty hard piece of data. And as I say, we, we, we just need to work through now the, de the, the quite intricate details of our modeling, which is, is, is broken down by sort of gender and by age band, and just and, and do our best to sort of calibrate it that way. But um, we, we're going to lean very, very heavily on this outturn data in terms of taxpayer numbers, because that's you know, the really hard piece of information that we have. We'll give very high weight. Okay. Right. Neil? Um, there, w there was a, oh, there's been a 8.1 percent SFC forecast error relating to la uh, landfill tax revenues being 11 million higher than forecast. Um, the error higher than the OBRs, which was 5.7 percent, and that made by the Scottish government in 2016 of 0.5 percent. Do you see any need to revise your approach to forecasting landfill tax at this stage? <laughs> um, so landfill tax is, 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 you know, is interesting. It's a combination of how much uh, waste actually uh, is destined for landfill, with all the programs encouraging other um, other routes for a lot of waste, and also the development of incineration capacity. Uh, and um, you know, we we look at when we think incinerators will be coming online and be able to, what capacity they have and so forth. Um, so we will take the data that we have and, and that then, I mean, all of the, the most up-to-date data feeds into our um, you know, ongoing uh, forecasts and, and we'll see where that comes out. John, you want yes, to- Yes, could I just add to that that this is an in-year forecast. So what it does is we had some available data for the first quarter and then we use the previous seasonal pattern um, of the, how previous four, previous four quarters, um, and we use that to extrapolate that first quarter's data forward. So what we're going to be doing is exactly as you say, we're going to have a look at that that seasonal pattern and make sure that what we're using reflects sort of the, the the distribution between quarters as it currently is, rather than as it was in the past. So there's a little bit of work for us to do there, and just recognise that we we got that that seasonal pattern slightly wrong last year. Okay. And I can also ask you about LBTT. On LBTT, there was an overall forecast error of zero. Um, but within that, there was a 5.1% error in residential LBTT and a minus 5.3% error for non-residential LBTT. So with that in mind, are you planning to make any revisions to your forecast methodology within LBTT? That, that, that was a similar, a similar but slightly different issue. Again, it was an in-year forecast, and that the principal forecast error in residential was driven by the fact that transactions in the lower end of the market, the lower half of the market, were much lower than we, we, we'd had estimated from the data. So we're just going to have an, another look at that um, again and just make sure that we, we're, we're on top of, the, of um, how that, that, that transactions data. Um, I think the housing market is, slightly, is, is more tricky to forecast than, than, than landfill in the sense it's not just a mechanistic approach of applying a seasonal pattern. So there's, there's some things that we, we need to just look at and, and, and you know, do a little bit more digging on that. But um, again, it's that sort of, it's the difficulty of doing an in-year forecast here, which is the, the issue about how we use the, the, the sort of the data we have for one quarter and extrapolate that forward. Angela, I know you had access to data issues you want to raise. I hope I didn't get into some of your territory in the area. Um, on. I mean, I, I was very interested in your difficulties with the Department of uh, Work and Pensions, which just, you know, for, for the record, I find uh, truly uh, shocking, given um, that until uh, Social Security Scotland is administering all the Scottish benefits, you're going to be particularly reliant on their data. But, um, uh, you know, the, the conveners uh, covered that uh, that, that point adequately, and I look forward to you uh, reading your correspondence about that. But I think more broadly, I would be interested to know um, 
you know, what are your experience with uh, other UK government departments and bodies, uh, whether there are examples of that uh, working well that could be replicated with uh, the DWP, uh, or also, you know, if there's a, a broader issue. Um, I'm aware, as committee will be aware, that the, the OBR have the, the right to access uh, information data from UK and Scottish bodies, whereas you only have the right uh, to access uh, information from Scottish bodies and not UK bodies. Um, so I just, you know, I'd be grateful if you could share some of your experiences and reflections on that, and if you had any ideas that could rectify matters. Uh, and I, I, I'm sure, you know, committee would be, um, you know, would have a, an ear to, to help if we could. Good question, and we appreciate that. Um, and, and I think um, I'll start simply by saying that this is necessarily, because this is all new that we're doing, it's an evolving landscape. So uh, what you said about our legal right to access is exactly correct, the way you've explained that. Um, and things move on and can still move on. So if I take Revenue Scotland as an example in Scotland, um, initially we were asking for data that they didn't necessarily produce and publish and, and so forth. Now some of the data that we require, they do produce and they do make public. Uh, and so things have moved on. We've work well with Revenue Scotland. We have some further interest and further developments there. So it's not just about UK and Scotland. It's about all of the agencies and all of us learning, um, you know, what to do. So uh, Revenue Scotland uses different accounting bases for, for different, uh, different numbers, and it would be helpful to have some public clarification of what that is and, and so forth. Um, with the UK bodies, we have had really from the beginning a very good working relationship with the OB are, but they're in a similar kind of business to us, um, and that, that is different from the uh, other other bodies there. We have a memorandum of understanding with HMRC, um, and again, that's been a developing relationship and needs to continue to develop. Um, but uh, but we feel that that good progress has been has been made there. We would be looking to enhance that memorandum of understanding, and, and that reflects what we can expect from each other to be at, to be requested, to be provided when, how we interact. It's very helpful to have those um, guidelines laid out. Uh, we understand from some of the UK agencies that, as I said in my earlier, they have a lot of requests for information, and you know they may feel they don't have enough. Um, uh, staff, you know, where we come in, in the pecking order is, a, is an issue. It's up to us to develop relationships as well. It isn't just about a method, it's about working together with other bodies, and we're working hard to do that with all of them. Um, so I don't know if, if either of you wants to say more on that. Uh, so I can't say there is a particular um, cudgel we can use to, uh, to, you know, to get what we need. We need to have people understand who we are fully, what we are, that we are independent from the Scottish government, and therefore have a right to ask for the data uh, that we're asking for, and um, that, uh, you know, that, that, that needs to be respected. We are a public body in our own right. I mean, I, I'm fully uh, understanding of the fact that, you know, some of this is a two-way process. It will indeed uh, depend on relationships and it's, it's, it's a journey that involves um, all partners and it requires everybody to, to come and go uh, a bit. Um, but it appears to me that, um, and, you know, people understand that some of these UK departments are very big departments. They have uh, many demands uh, upon them. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wondered what your thoughts were in terms of... Um, ensuring the visibility um, of the Fiscal Commission to ensure you're a wee bit higher um, up uh, the pecking order and whether this is just about a series of memorandums and agreements or whether there's actually just something more fundamental like the legislative uh, right uh, of access to information uh, which would um, diminish the need uh, for you know, layer upon layer of agreement. Um, so we're going in at lots of different levels and through through others and ourselves to try to, particularly with the DWP, to try to uh, escalate this and enhance their understanding and, and responsiveness. Alistair, did you want to say something? Well, I, I think it's perhaps helpful to to think about the, t the, the timing of, of different elements of devolution in this. Um, because as Susan said, uh, our relationship with HMRC ha 
has developed in a positive direction. There were, there were things that we needed from them, and we developed a memorandum of understanding, and in the way that's set out in our report, uh, that relationship is currently developing in a way that is very positive for us. Um, but the income tax story it, it started sooner than the, the devolution of social security story. Uh, so not to be too negative about it, DWP are coming to, to the devolution issues a bit later on than, than HMRC. It's not unduly surprising that a big UK agency with its own administrative budget priorities and its, 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 uh, its, its budget tightness um, should be cautious about how it handles devolution and the initial, the initial desire to work entirely through the Scottish Government is, is an, an understandable response. Being positive about it, we would hope that as the devolution of social security expenditure evolves, uh, the DWP will acquire the kind of understanding of the independence of the Fiscal Commission from the Scottish Government that HMRC has and develop the kind of understanding of our needs that the HMRC is, is, is developing. So I don't think we should, at this stage, be, be too negative about it. Yes, there, there are problems, as the convener has, has, has noted. Uh, it's sensible at this stage to try and walk these through and hope that we will get the kind of evolution of relationship that we've had with, with HMRC. And just in, in response to the last part of your question, um, I think any interest in legislative agreements would be a matter for ex exchequers to have uh, from, from Scotland and from uh, Treasury to have conversations on that, so beyond us. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm interested in what you said in your opening statement, Dame Susan, about the forecasts are not an exact science. And in our briefing papers, it says that there was revisions to the estimate of GDP growth in August, and that that's just one example of revisions to GDP. And uh, it's not unusual that revisions are made. So in, in our papers, it says that given the uncertainties and errors around measuring GDP and the uncertain link between GDP and the size of the tax bases in the short run, are the resources that you devote to forecasting GDP justifiable? I mean, would it be better to focus forecasting in other methods using a uh, fiscal forecast, for instance? Um, I'd, I'd, I'd make a couple of different responses to that. One, yes, yes there are inherent uncertainties about um, forecasting the economy. Um, but the, the issue that we've had this year with the construction industry data that we've already discussed uh, is of an unusual magnitude. So this shouldn't be taken as symptomatic of, of the kind of problem that we're going to face with ev every one of our forecasts. Um, but uh, Addressing your main question, no, I, don't, I don't, don't think the right response would be to step back from attempting to, to do the best forecast we have of their economy. The government needs forecasts of their economy. We are the official forecaster for the government. It's very hard for government to make economic policy, not just in the tax area, but across a wider range, without access to proper macroeconomic forecasts. So, Someone has to do it, and it's our job to do it. And we, we think that this uh, evaluation report shows that notwithstanding the challenges, we're doing a pretty good job of it. So we're, uh, we're not ready to hoist the white flag and say, sorry, this is just too difficult for us to do, and you've got to find someone else to, to pick it up. We, we, it has to be done. We're doing it. We think we're doing it well, notwithstanding uh, the challenges. And it's not... And, and, there are important links between the economy forecast and the, the fiscal forecast. At the last meeting with you, we had a long discussion. I th indeed, I recall virtually the whole of uh, the hearing was devoted to changes in our income tax forecast that incidentally now <laughs> seem like small beer compared with the revision of income taxes that we're talking about today. But that. Uh, income tax forecast that we were discussing at last meeting was driven by a change in the economy forecast. And, and in 
forecasting income taxes and forecasting VAT, which is a task that, that is coming onto our agenda now, uh, you need a forecast of the economy because you're not going to be able to produce good income tax forecasts without as good a picture as you can have of what's going on in the broader economy. And can I just sort of go around that? We have a, a formal uh, legislative remit, and it is to do f forecasting, fiscal forecasting for devolved taxes. Um, we also um, are now required to forecast assigned um, sort of revenue streams, such as from VAT, uh, looking at the cost of benefits, um, such as the Social Security uh, benefits, which will come to Scotland. And it's also a requirement that we forecast onshore GDP for Scotland. So we need to do all of those. Um, Alistair's given you good reasons why we would want to do those. And I think for many of those, all of them really, what we try to do is bring a Scottish lens, and this is for the economy and other forecasts, a Scottish lens, Scottish data, what is happening here? It's not just a 12th or whatever the fraction is of the UK. And so with the economy forecast, the economy forecasts always have revisions, and there will be more to this one. But I think we're still in a better place bringing that lens to it and doing that work ourselves. Okay, James Kelly asked about um, tax forecasts, and I'm just wondering if, with, when you're forecasting and you're making associations with GDP and there's errors, are there knock-on implications then when you are um, trying to make it accurate when you're doing tax forecasting? One of the reasons for doing a forecast evaluation um, on an annual basis is to look back uh, and see the source of errors. So forecasts all have errors, um, even the ones where the numbers match. You can see that underneath that, as we've stated, um, there are errors in this or that element. So what we do, it's a constant iterative process. Uh, and as we learn um, from how we approach things, decisions we made in the past, or new data that, has, that have come in, um, we bring that to bear on future forecasts. So the job is not to let um, one error just sit there forever and, and grow and grow in magnitude in terms of the future. We'd constantly be adapting. Okay. Uh, and there is one very significant knock-on implication, just sticking with the, the income tax example, um, that when, when we have, when the, when the governments, the two governments have income tax outturns for uh, this, this fiscal year 2018-19, uh, there will be a reconciliation of the actual of budget allocations that were made for this year with the income tax and other tax outturns. And it's desirable for everybody uh, that those reconciliations which happen two years down the line at as small as possible, so that the initial budget allocations made to the Scottish Government are as close as possible to the final budget allocations. So that's, that's one importance of having income tax forecasts as accurate as possible, because you want those knock-on implications in the reconciliation two years down the line to be as small as possible. Okay, thanks. i move this on. Listen, if, if, if we think it's difficult getting forecasts right on income tax, just wait till we get to assignment of VAT. That's going to be a real interesting situation when there's no actual definitive information available to make these forecasts on. But never mind. Murdo, I'm sure that's not what you're going to come No, it wasn't. I was just going to follow up Emma Harper's uh, questions about um, your estimates, uh, sorry, forecasts around GDP growth. And you say quite a lot in, in, in your paper around how uh, the 2017-18 figure has been revised upwards, but you revised downwards. The, the figures for the, the previous years. And, and I think there's also mention in your report, you talk about the forecast post 2017-18 uh, as looking subdued, I think is, is the word you used. Just, just so we're clear, are you saying therefore that 2017-18 is, is, is a blip? Are we expecting post 2017-18 longer term GDP growth to, to revert to where it was before that, below the UK trend figure, or, or, or do we know? It's a good question because I think it's one that a lot of people might ask. Um, the 1718 change, primarily related to a different understanding of the construction industry, is that point in time. It's for that one year. We, as Alistair explained before, and I think John as well, and the report, um, knew there was something funny about um, the construction data. So for 1718, 
Um, we didn't know what the, uh, the new numbers would be, but we thought something might change. So for the long-term forecast, we um, it, it, it sort of a rough uh, explanation is um, our colleagues extracted the construction data because we just weren't too comfortable, looked at all of the other data, got their trends, their averages, um, looked at that, and then looked at the construction data and got some trends and averages there, kind of you know, merged it back in. The, the term used, we were talking to a colleague yesterday, was stitched that back into all of the others. So the economy forecast, the GDP forecast, is made up of lots of elements. And for that reason, we can comfortably say that the 1718 numbers were, in essence, flattened out in our long-term long view. And that long-term view hasn't changed much. And if anything, it's slightly weaker um, than it was even a few months ago. So subdued isn't a new word for us. I'm afraid it's one we've been using for a little while. Okay, so, so, so just so you're clear, you, you, you expect going forward that, that Scottish economic growth will still lag behind UK economic growth? Well, I'd like to say two things. One, we haven't, we haven't made a new forecast. So, so this is a forecast evaluation. So when we're talking about it, it's not changing our long-run view, I should really say, it's not likely to change our long-run view because uh, the... the the changes in the data over the last three or four years um, give us a higher growth rate in the last year, but not a higher growth rate overall. So it's unlikely uh, when we come to doing our next forecast in December that that's going to change our, our view. And as Susan said, uh, all the indications are that we'll still have a subdued long-run forecast. The other point to make in response to your question is that, uh, uh, yes, this past year's growth rate has been higher than we had anticipated. Um, is it a blip? Well, we, we'll, we, we will consider these things properly in our December forecast. But a, but a, a, a one-year growth rate of 1.3% is not an exceptionally high number if you thought that the long-run growth rate were, was somewhere between half and 1%. So it's not... So one year's number of 1.3% isn't the kind of number that's going to knock you off uh, a, a forecast whose long run is lower than 1.3 percent, but not way above it. It's not a, uh, it's not an earth-shattering. So we shouldn't get too excited view. about it. Is what you're saying? <laughs> that's what we're saying. <laughs> well, for, Fair enough. At, this, go, at um, this stage, um, wait and see. Uh, right. Okay. For, James. Forecasters never get over excited. <laughs> James. Yeah, just very briefly, Convener Murdoch covered most of what I was going to ask. Um, <laughs> the, you said, Dame Susan, in response to Murdoch Fraser, that if anything, the, you felt that the, the, the forecast going forward would, would it, if anything, would now be weaker than it was a few months ago. What, what led you to say that? It, only, only marginally so. And as I say, we haven't, it, as Alistair just said, we haven't reforecast uh, everything. But we would ask ourselves um, the same question that we were just asked about the impact of this change uh, in the 1718 um, number and have given that some thought. And uh, it's really looking at our whole methodology that we don't see that impacting very much. John, is there anything that would cause us to be even more conservative long term? I think it's right. It's, it's just a matter of a very small degree. And it's, the remark is based on the fact that if you look at the growth rates and the revised data since 2010, they're marginally lower than they were before the revisions. So it's just that. It's just that. I mean, if, if you happen to have the uh, the, the, our summary report uh, to hand, then uh, figure one on page nine it illustrates the issue in, in that um, the, the actual number is higher in, for 2017 than our forecast number. But if you look across the full range, the actuals are, uh, are below the forecast numbers more of the time than they were above it. So that's a slightly long-winded way of saying that, that the but the, the overall economic growth picture on the actuals is just slightly below what it was in the forecast, even though it's higher right at the end of the period. OK, thank you. Thank you very much uh, to our colleagues from the Scottish Fiscal Commission for coming along today. That concludes this particular session this morning. Uh, I now suspend uh, till a changeover for the other witnesses. Thank you very much. Very grateful for you being here.
Um, colleagues, the, the last item on public business today take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on the proposed contingency liability relating to a standby loan facility for a development site at Winchborough. I welcome to the meeting Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance, Economy and Fair Work, uh, Will Quinn, who is the Guarantee Scheme Manager, and Michael Walker, who is the Finance Business Partner. Uh, members have received copies of a letter from the Cabinet Secretary setting out the background to the request. The Committee will uh, consider the response to the request in private later in the meeting, and then will write to the Cabinet Secretary to confirm our decision. But before we move to questions, Cabinet Secretary, can I invite you to make any short opening statement that you wish to make? Uh, thank you and uh, good morning, Convener. I am indeed here to invite Committee approval for a £15 million contingent liability to unlock major economic development in central Scotland at Winchborough, West Lothian. This vitally important strategic site is on the point of stalling and urgent Scottish Government involvement is required. What I'm asking you to consider is the minimum intervention required from Government to unlock the full development. The papers before you indicate the scale of economic activity on what is an active site that has reached a critical point. This proposal will allow the planning conditions to be met and for the cap on construction to be lifted. Your approval of this contingent liability will pave the way for new school provision, community facilities and essential transport infrastructure. All of this alongside 3,450 new homes, 25 per cent being for affordable rent, to contribute to one of the highest rates of population growth in Scotland. This risk-sharing package has been subject to extensive due diligence and is the right type of intervention by government, pitched at the right level to demonstrate our commitment to provide an economic stimulus, whilst limiting our exposure to financial risk. And I would ask the committee to consider the significant economic benefits that will be delivered to central Scotland through the approval of this essential contingent liability. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Your letter states that the developer has been unable to secure affordable market rate finance to forward fund all the infrastructure needed to develop the site. And, and, and it made me wonder in that regard why this situation has actually been arrived at. What happened in regard to the initial financing of the site development that did not anticipate this? Uh, or, or, or was it anticipated? Now, I suppose it is partly the history and the changing costs and the recognition that there is a lot of front loading of the capital investment that is required. And once that has been costed and considered, how that is then profiled in terms of the income that developers will have through the units being developed and built. So I suppose it is a full understanding of the costs and what has come through the negotiation of what would be required by way of planning consent and then ultimately how that is um, uh, delivered and why this um, financial tool would be required. That is my understanding. Maybe officials could give you more of the history about what has changed from initial uh, inception. Yes, yeah. okay. Thank you. Um, I think that that is absolutely correct. Uh, what, what this really comes down to is the scale of the development and the infrastructure that is required up front. In terms of the, the package that is being asked for here, um, the, the delivery of the, the school is a planning requirement um, and, as is stated in the papers, the, the developer is unable to um, secure that affordable finance to, to front fund. Um, West Lothian Council are engaged in, in the wider infrastructure that is required and are carrying the maximum risk that is allowed under their governance arrangements. Uh, look, I think we are all quite grateful that the Scottish Government are able to help deliver this sort of output, but the, the question is, was this not in, at the beginning of this process, was it anticipated there would be a requirement for government to be involved, or did they think that the, between West Lothian Council and the developer that they could put together the package that would release this site and make it work? How did, how did we get with the government getting involved? I think um, the, the answer to that is that the developer and West Lothian Council have been engaged in negotiations for quite a number of years. Um, so they, they have been developing um, their they have been developing how they might take this site forward given the scale. 
So it's an iterative pro process, is what you're saying. It's, it's an evolving process that you've come to where you've come, where, 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 why the government's been involved. I can understand that. I more suppose. Now. I suppose what would happen in other circumstances, Kevin, this is exceptional, of course, because of the scale here, and it is a useful instrument and model to say if we can intervene to help with the infrastructure to unlock development, find a financial tool to do that. What would ordinarily happen, of course, is developers would be negotiating with the planning authority, and if it doesn't work, work out, people just walk away, and it doesn't happen. But the council has been so keen to see this through. They've looked at how they can be really innovative in delivering the infrastructure element because of the public benefits it brings as well. So there's the economic benefit of the units, but the infrastructure, the schools, the education, and the public transport elements, I think, have encourage the Council to try and find other ways to make sure that the development can happen in recognition of the benefits and the need and the population demands in that area. Government, of course, we have commissioned officials across government to support sustainable economic growth, it, whilst limiting our exposure. And fundamentally, rather than see it all fall apart, our role here is to put that final piece of the jigsaw in place so that the Council and the developers can see their mutually agreed aims uh, delivered, rather than us being involved at the start, to say, how can we plan in an intervention? It's more, how can we help seal the deal, I suppose? It's a very helpful okay. contribution. Alex. Thank you, convener, and can I note my register of interest in the development sector? Uh, a couple of questions. The first one's uh, following on from the convener's point. Yeah, do you think that this has come about because banks are becoming more restricted by uh, their ability to lend to different sectors, and the, the development sector being one of them? And if that is the case, do you think this is going to be the first of several requests to Scottish Government uh, to act as a lender of last resort? Um, when I speak to the banks, they tell me there's plenty capital. When I speak to other um, business interests seeking um, financial support, they give me a slightly different perspective on things. Um, this is as much, I suppose, about simply the upfront infrastructure spend that uh, is required to unlock the rest of the development, which is um, a welcome. You know, it has its, has its planning um, approval. Um, which then takes me to um, the point around, is this the kind of model that we would want to um, deploy? There's a range of measures in uh, our toolbox, essentially, um, to support appropriate development, um, tax incremental finance, a growth accelerator model, how we use financial transactions. We've got other infrastructure loan funds. So there's a range of different financial products we can use to support development that's worthy of support. Of course, the, the interesting element here is, is the use of contingent liability, essentially that we're offering that financial support to the local authority, which in itself is doing quite an innovative thing in how they are delivering the uh, infrastructure investment to unlock the development, because again, of, of all the benefits it brings. So although this is, it feels exceptional because of scale and some of the factors um, involved, I do think it is a useful financial tool that is at government and, frankly, because of committee's um, approval, you know, at your disposal as well to say, is this the right kind of intervention, which has such support it feels worthy of that in intervention. Uh, hopefully, of course, this risk never materialises for the government. That's why there's many safeguards in place. But it gives that final uh, security, in a sense, to allow the product, if you like, to be used to support the objectives of the development. Uh, thank you. Um, my second question is more about the detail of some of it. Um, you, know, you talk about a commitment fee or arrangement fee. I'm wondering how much uh, that is. And you talk about uh, any funds drawn down will be repayable of interest. I wonder if you can clarify what rate that will be at. Uh, and then one item which doesn't seem to be mentioned uh, is that is, is overage. You know, you know, if the returns uh, exceed the model being financed here, um, what will the Scottish Government recover? I mean, you know, obviously, sharing the risk is one thing, but if there's reward as beyond what is expected, you know, how will um, the Scottish Government has facilitated this whole development, uh, how will the Scottish Government benefit from this? It, it would, uh, whilst government's always keen to get credit for things, um, this is a financial product that kind of gives a backstop in a sense. I wouldn't want to be portrayed as if we've then got a kind of financial share in the overall development, that'd be quite a different proposition. In terms of the detail of um, rate, uh, of course it has to be stated compliant as well, it's gone through all that due diligence. Do we have further information on uh, the, the yep. arrangement fee? 
I can answer that. The um, the fee the interest rates on the commitment fee is two percent, and uh, on top of any drawings are two percent plus a one point one percent margin. Uh, as the cabinet secretary has mentioned, those have been uh, scaled as a result of state aid due diligence, and and that's that's why they've come up with that. We had our advisors, Grant Thornton, look at look at similar interventions in the in the market compared to how private sector providers would would act in this scenario and that's how they've determined an appropriate rate thank you angela uh, thank you convener uh, good morning cabinet secretary um, i shared with the uh, colleagues um uh, earlier that um, I'm uh, aware of the, the Winchborough uh, proposition. It's not in my uh, constituency, but it is in the neighbouring uh, West Lothian constituency, and it will obviously have, um, you know, if, when it comes to fruition, um, you know, an impact uh, locally in West Lothian in terms of economic development, uh, but also in, in the wider region. And as it's part of the, the, the city deal and the whole uh, resin debt of city deals is, of course, to uh, promote economic development and growth uh, and house building, not just in cities, uh, but in the, the, the regions that, that, that surround the, 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 the cities. But I am conscious, because of my local knowledge, um, that, that you know, the genesis of identifying uh, you know, this project in this area for, for, for development we would not have uh, rested with the government, and that would have been with um, other uh, partners, be it you know, the local authority uh, or the, the, the developers. So I think it is important uh, to understand more about the, 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 the when and the why uh, the Scottish government uh, got involved you know what were you know the particular challenges and I also wondered if there were uh, you know particular points of learning um, it is uh, entirely appropriate that people should not just be building houses without the infrastructure uh, but obviously the planning consent in this instance uh, has uh, you know been uh, a, a barrier uh, and also in terms of you know is, is there learning for, for, for developers and also local authorities uh, in, in particular, in terms of you know taking forward, uh, hopefully uh, future uh, projects of this magnitude and scale. Uh, convener, I think those are uh, helpful uh, comments and questions within that as well. I suppose the, the financial element would have been under negotiation between uh, the council and the developers to arrive at finally what was the proposition in the package, and then the, the question in that was what what is government willing to do as, as part of it, um, and we would have taken uh, a proactive approach in trying to make sure that the development happens um, by uh, offering this support, which is essentially, as we've described, was the, the council kind of using um, their uh, borrowing regime to make sure the infrastructure development happens, to unlock the development, and then, of course, they get the return. Uh, they get the, the, the enhanced infrastructure for the area, the council area, but they get the um, a financial return as well based on the units that are being developed. Um, so that's not the, the, the immediate role of Scottish Government to have, have done that, but we, we would have been there participating to see what we can do to um, a, a support in the end, as I say, having come this far, that this is the, the, the final financial element that makes it work is our understanding. So we're always cooperative, but we would try and minimise um, essentially the public sector risk, but the government's risk within that and if it crystallises then it, then it's still um, the resources have to be returned to government and I entirely take on board the, the comments around a uh, planning and the local authorities lead role in housing provision and we, we're trying to be supportive of that um, objective Thank you very much good morning um, if this facility is ultimately uh, drawn down if it's if it's used can you give clarity that no part of the developer's contribution ultimately will be borne by the taxpayer as a result of this mechanism? Uh, yes, um, they, they are, they're still absolutely liable for that. And can I maybe express about how, how it might crystallise in terms of how it would impact on government if, if that was then to materialise? So if all the, uh, you know, if, if there was failure to the extent that it was called upon there's a range of which I think you have in your pack, the um, security that we have over it, the, the other calls and resources before it finally comes to government. And if it crystallises for us, um, 
it, we would have advance notice of that and we'd be able to plan it into a budget because it wouldn't happen you know, within a week or a month. We would have a period of at least, well, a year, I suppose, but forecast to be able to build it into a budget and the maximum exposure would be up to about £850,000 in a year. So that would be manageable for us um, to understand, but, but no, the, the, the burden would still be on the developers to absolutely fulfil their um, condition obligations. Yes. So the, the basic reason as you've set out for, for this being needed, is that the developer wasn't able to access the finance that they'd uh, hoped. What gives you confidence that they will have the money ultimately? Because, well, there'd be security on the land, um, so we would hold, um, would hold them to account for that, and the income is to derive from the units been sold as well. So it's absolute worst case, almost unforeseeable scenario that the units wouldn't be developed out and that liability would still rest eh, with the developer. Okay, yeah, just that in terms of how, how we're comfortable that the developer has the, the fin financing required to, to, to put toward the, the school infrastructure in this case is that the council will be forward funding it. So therefore, that risk is taken away from the, the developer to that extent. However, the development contributions will still need to return um, from, from the units sold to the council. And that's, that's, how, that's how we're comfortable that the financing is there and in the pro OK, thank you. Thank you. Adam? Uh, thank you, Kamina. Um, uh, Cabinet Secretary, in your um, papers that you provided to the committee for this um, uh, matter, um, you identify that um, the Winchborough, Winchborough development is identified in the Edinburgh city deal um, uh, as a priority site for development. Is, is this kind of um, risk sharing uh, involving or not involving the kind of contingent liabilities that we're talking about this morning, in your view, likely to become a feature of city and uh, regional growth deals uh, as they are being um, unfolded and, um, and developed across Scotland? We know that a number are still uh, in various forms of uh, negotiation, in Stirling and Clackmannanshire and Tayside, uh, Ayrshire and uh, elsewhere in, in, in Scotland. Is, is, is this likely to become a, a, a feature of um, city and growth deals um, uh, as, as we look forward? I should say for um, completeness to Mr Tompkins um, that I don't want to encroach in other Cabinet Secretary's portfolios that Mr Matheson will lead on city deal negotiations as the Infrastructure Secretary, but from my point of view as Finance Secretary, if it's contributing to the economy, I think we should look at a range of financial tools at the government's disposal to support that sustainable economic growth. And a members of the committee will be well aware of other contingent liabilities where we've set out how we're trying to be supportive of industry and the economy uh, to help stimulate appropriate development. I, I think it could be, I think it, it, this is um, exceptional by its nature, but yes, I think it could be used in future arrangements uh, in partnership with local authorities where they might want to set out how they want infrastructure to be delivered and they might want to use the same or a similar model. So yes, we're open to that financially, but in every occasion we'd want to understand the business case, and that could feature within city deals. Uh, but equally, it could be out with city deals as well. It so happens that this was part of the, in terms of the overall government support for this site and the region, part of that dialogue and that engagement because it's supported by the local authority, uh, the wider region uh, and uh, government, and for that matter, because of the nature of city deals, UK government would have had a overall view as well. Uh, I will engage with the Secretary of State on future city deals uh, so that we can try and ensure that city deals cover the whole country. Yes, in essence, is the answer to the question. We're open to using this financial model, uh, but not exclusively to city deals uh, where appropriate to support development and put in place the necessary infrastructure that can unlock wider benefits. In the programme for government last week, I don't have it in front of me, but in the programme for government last week, I recall the First Minister talking in her statement to Parliament about um, uh, new infrastructure funding. And I, I hear what you say about Michael Matheson and his portfolio responsibilities, but as the um, Cabinet Secretary, who will in due course be proposing a budget to the, to the Parliament, do you foresee that these kinds of risk-sharing arrangements might be um, a part of the um, Scottish Government's um, uh, new, new investment in infrastructure in Scotland? The, I, I think it can be part of the infrastructure um, drive that we're trying to undertake um, because um, 
it may well turn out to be a very useful financial tool, but the specific commitment that the First Minister gave around infrastructure spend as a proportion of GDP, um, this financial model is quite separate to that figure, because that figure will be about what we're able to invest by way of direct infrastructure spend. What this is about, of course, is the contingent liability that we are creating because of the financial model that we're using in this instance. So I think the vision is absolutely clear, and of course we'll be returning to Parliament with all the detail on that infrastructure spend, uh, but to be absolutely clear to give the most accurate answer possible to that question, this financial tool is different from that a infrastructure announcement that was made by the First Minister's uh, programme for government. Thank you for that. I'm, I, I suppose I'm just trying to understand the relationship between the various different, as it were, pots of money that are, um, as it were, on the table. We've got city deal money. Uh, we've got new inf new announcements of infrastructure investment from the in the programme for government last week, and we've got contingent liabilities. I'm just trying to understand what the relationship is between the contingent liability and the other two um, broader pots of money. That and you've been helpful on that. Okay, well, all of us, of course, have to make sure all of it is affordable, and that's why understanding the liabilities we're taking on is critical in terms of affordability and understanding uh, the risk. But that headline commitment, so I'm just being clear, that headline commitment is about actual spend, whereas, of course, this financial tool is about the risk we're taking on to ensure that infrastructure spend happens. I thank the Cabinet and Secretary and officials for coming today. At the start of the meeting, uh, the committee agreed to take the next item in private. The committee will meet again the 26th of September. The continue taking evidence as part of our inquiry into the 2019-20 pre-budget scrutiny. I therefore now close this public part of the meeting.